Welcome to M Squared TechCast, a live internet radio show offering the latest news and interviews with the people driving business, technology, and politics in Michigan. Now, your hosts, Matt Rausch and Mike Brennan. Hey, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with our second week of the video version of the M Squared TechCast. Yep. And we're still not in the TV studio. It's just been one thing after another. Yep, afraid so. Last week was no AC, and this week no power. But uh, we're optimistic that the third time next week is going to be the charm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So now you know at least what the old studio looks yes, like. Right? Yes, This is the old uh, Podcast Detroit uh, audio studio, which yes. is a fun place to be. Yes, and, and hopefully we'll be in the uh, – it'll be more of a Tonight Show kind of format, Matt and I behind the desk, mm-hmm. and then we'll have the guests there – Immediately, probably to our right mm-hmm. and your uh, left, our left for uh, the audience, depending. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, and then it'll be a little tighter because right now these cameras you don't really focus in real tightly on the faces and sort of so it'll be a lot. Which in my case is a good thing, but uh, well, you, know, you look a little some, red today. Some of know, our I guests. Know. Well, I've I've had a lot of sun the last ten days. I've been out of town. I know. I I follow you on Facebook. You and your your lovely wife have yes. been Maybe. jaunting mm-hmm. about. Uh, yeah, we did a rather epic ten day. 2400 mile road trip all the way around the north end of Lake Superior. It was spectacularly beautiful. It's a little village and then 100 miles of boreal forest without so much as a shed. Yeah. And then a little village and another 100 miles of boreal forest. It was just gorgeous. And lots of places to get out and hike and see waterfalls and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. And the black flies were like everywhere. Uh, they respond to DEET. Yes. Yeah. If you if you put some of that stuff on, they stay away from you. Oh, so, perfect. Yeah. Okay. We did not see a bear. We did not see a moose. So... You know, we were kind of looking forward to that, but we didn't see either of those. We oh. saw some very scruffy-looking foxes and some deer. Yeah. So, but that was it. Okay. And a whole bunch of other tourists. Yes, I'm so, sure. Yep. I haven't been up there in a long time. But uh, we're, we're, we're keeping our guests waiting as we do all this uh, small talk. <laughs> yeah, and, and today's show is interesting to me because it is, it is cannabis-focused, yep. which is one of your new enterprises. Let's, yep. let's get your plug in first, Mike. Okay, this, uh, the Michigan <laughs> Marijuana Report, yes, uh, M- mimarijuanareport.com. Yep. It's, it's brand new. Uh, we've been doing a lot of pickups from other publications, but going forward, the launch with this show, we have all this video coming out, and then all of our guests, we're going to try to then get unique content because you know, that's really what pulls in the audience and, of course, the advertisers. In the end, you got to make a buck or it doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, Anthony Sabatella, who uh, I met uh, beginning of the year, I guess, right? Yep, right about. Yeah, and so uh, he is with a group called THC123, um, and I'll let him explain what that is. Yep, well, THC123, we're a business administration platform. Uh, we are a hybrid between a professional employer organization and employment agency specifically focused for the cannabis space. And what all that jargon and all that BS means <laughs> is we are cannabis HR. So we'll be able to handle everything from payroll, tax management, employee benefits, workers' compensation for the employers, but also for the people looking to get into the cannabis space. We'll leverage ourselves as a technology platform and have a industry job board, online certifications, and everything in one location that you can then Find what you're looking for here in the cannabis space. Okay, and a uh, couple things. Um, you just launched. Well, let, let's back up even more. <laughs> now, your father and your family are heavily involved in the same sort of area. Yep, right? yep. My dad uh, is the owner of America's Back Office. Uh, we're a nationwide professional employer organization. We have clients in all 50 states. So, understanding that that's the backbone and the engine behind THC123, I decided to take that one step further, add on the employment agency aspect, add on the insurance agency aspect, and that way we can handle employment in a full 360 degree uh, outsource model for our clients. So, I guess begs the question, why did you decide to get into the cannabis business? I know you, uh, I have been at events with you, so I know, mm-hmm. I, how do we say this gently? I guess you are a, you use it from time to time, yes? Yeah, I've inhaled. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to some of our past presidents who didn't, of course. Oh, but, yes, uh, right. So uh, it was that, and, and what? some who could, I think, seriously use it. But that's, <laughs> uh, that's a different story. Get mellow on, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so um, you got into it obviously because you had an inclination in this area, but also because you probably saw an opportunity, right? Well, I would say an opportunity, but I also saw an industry and a market that truly needed that extra lift in the areas that I, you know, luckily have, you know, these resources to provide. Uh, if you take a look at the cannabis industry, you know, we all know that it's raised from the black market into this kind of gray limbo market that um, has existed for, let's call it the last five or so years. Um, but what's now is this industry is now normalized across multiple state lines, almost to a federal level. Almost. Almost. We're almost there. But where where this industry has gone is, is more into big business. It's to more of a normalized business. So who else but a company that handles outsourced HR and outsourced big business practices that really needs to give, you know, that hand up to bring in, um, you know, this industry and help normalize it on its uh, on its way up. OK. Mm -hmm. Matt, do you have a question? Well, um, you know, there's there's PEOs. Um, what what do you bring to the table in terms of a, a cannabis specialist? In cannabis this area? specialist. Um, uh, I practice what I preach. You know, the difference between you know myself and a normal PEO owner is, you know, I was raised in this generation. I was raised in this industry, in this community. You know, so my, my knowledge as an industry expert will speak volumes there, but also understanding that, uh, you know, myself at having a hybrid skill set, I bring in the um, PEO and I bring in the, um, you know, we'll call it business technology platform. You know, that's my niche in, the, in this industry. So, you know, understanding what I'm bringing to the table, you know, I'm looking to specialize that and have that focused on the cannabis industry as a whole. Okay. okay. And then one of the things uh, that just uh, occurred, I, I think it was a week or so ago, uh, we were going to start this earlier, but we were waiting to time it because you come out with a new website. Why don't you talk about that? Yep. I just uh, launched a website. It's called MyCanajobs.com. And what this website is, is going to be a digital employment agency specifically for the cannabis space. If you're a uh, candidate looking to get in this space, we're going to have an online job board that you can go to. Instead of sending your resume into five, six, seven different locations, you know, to people you, you don't even know the contact point for, why not leverage a platform that uh, you can go and send your resume in once to THC123, and then you can have one-click applies to multiple different locations and different uh, opportunities. Now, one of the things that there's probably a lot of people interested in getting into this space for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is they see the job opportunities, but they may not have the skills. Is there some way to work with apprentices or anything like that or give them training? It's, it, it's tough understanding where this industry ha has came from. You know, these were this was an industry attacked and discriminated against, you know, for, for multitudes of years and continuing currently. Uh, so understanding that trust is, is a huge, huge issue, you know, but understanding that training is a necessity, you know, bringing social equity to the uh, groups that were disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs and, and the war on marijuana. You know, we need to find a way to implement ways to um, help those people. And, and the way I look to do it is look through leveraging technology and a digital platform to do so. Okay. All right. Um, so tell me a little bit about the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the addition. You're, you're more than just a PEO here, right? You're a, you're yeah, a talent I, bank. Where, where do you find these folks? Where do we find them? Uh, the nice part is, is leveraging the technology that we use. We use a, uh, a uh, platform right now called Breezy HR, but we're, we're in the uh, research and development stage of building our own platform to handle this. And what we're looking to do is create... Uh, we'll call it a hybrid between Monster.com and, ca and Kayak.com, specifically for um, resume building and um, talent um, acquisition in the cannabis space. So if we're able to post one job posting, that goes out to 20 different job boards, and we can aggregate all the results back to one. You know, we, we cut down on time, money, and energy spent by 
all parties, which uh, and unfortunately, time is money, especially mm-hmm. in cannabis. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so one of the things that I, I noticed um, while I was gone, I sat down and read all the papers that <laughs> I missed while I was gone over the last couple of days. Um, the state, in terms of the recreational marijuana business license, does not have a capital requirement as it does for the medical marijuana um, mm-hmm. um, dispensary license. So that means it's going to be more open to startups and very small businesses. So let's talk about the opportunity for micro businesses in this space. Yeah, micro business. I I I I think it's a great opportunity uh, for people to get into. Um, I would just. Um, you know, let them know that, you know, just because you're growing cannabis, it does not mean you're going to just grow money. It, you tr- truly need to know your product. You need to know the supply chain. You need to know, you know, a multitude of different business um, backgrounds to really make this work. Um, and what I really look to do is tell people to look, look to industry experts, look to people that are pioneering, paving the way. Look to the service providers because those are the people that are going to help your business. And they've seen it time and time again with businesses just like yours. So they're able to offer a pretty unique perspective, you know, to help these companies get off the ground. Mm -hmm. About two minutes left. So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, where folks can find a lot of this information. This is the shameless plug event again. Uh, (laughs) Or let's talk a little bit about so with THC one two three. Uh, oh, one last thing too. I'm going to ask. I think we talked about this earlier. Is uh, just because someone submits a resume doesn't necessarily mean that's really the talent they have. How do you screen the resumes? Oh, you got to look at the resumes. You got to ask them, and you got to get to know the person. You know, so we we really look to find uh, members of local communities, trying to search them from the towns and the cities that uh, these businesses are sourced from. You know, so we have opportunities for business owners at THC123.com. We have opportunities for um, prospects for the industry. Uh, that's going to be over at MyCannaJobs.com. And also, if you're an employer, this is a free job board. We're offering this to the uh, community for free. So please come on and uh, take a look and try to source some of your talent and get hired over at THC123.com. Which segues into just that. So thc one two three dot com is the platform you need to go to, right? Yep, that's correct. And then, uh, just like any other job board, you fill out some online paperwork, you submit a resume, and then voila, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we look to leverage uh, social media. We look to leverage the platforms that people use on their day to day lifestyles. Get to know a little bit more about you, and look to try to find you that job and find you that new career in the cannabis space. Okay. With the little bit of time we have left, one, one minute. minute. Um, I, I wanted to discuss what you think about the opportunities are for sort of industrial hemp production uh, beyond the recreational, you know, pleasure use of marijuana. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for Do you think that's going to be big in Michigan? I, I think big. Um, if you consider, um, you know, if you consider the cannabis space as a Goliath, that's just the tip of the iceberg when you look at industrial hemp. The applications for industrial hemp, including in our roads, such as hemp adobe and hempcrete that can expand and contract uh, better than asphalt and concrete. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's a time for Michigan and the Department of Transportation to take a look at that. <laughs> Interesting. I'll have to wrap it with that, Matt. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Anthony Sabatella, president of THC123. We'll be back in just a minute with another segment. For right now, this is Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you're listening to and watching the M Squared TechCast. Indeed. Okay. Headphones off.
Five cures. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And I'm stepping all over Mike Brennan. How yeah. about that? Well, I've been gone for a few weeks. so He's out of practice. So. Yeah. But uh, we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast here at PodcastDetroit.com and wherever else you might get your fine podcasts. Yeah, and, and the whole show is being devoted to the cannabis micro business. And so people go, why is the technology show focused on cannabis? Well, there are there's some technology involved. But more importantly, we are a show that also supports entrepreneurs. Economic and, development. And economic development. Yep. And gosh, this is one huge opportunity, particularly for micro-businesses. And so we have with us Roberta King, who is the owner of Canna Communications. And she's going to explain to those micro-businesses what some of these PR essentials should be. All right. Well, great. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, I'm going to just give you some background. I started Canna Communication about two years ago. It'll be two years in um, August, too. And I came from a background in communications, public relations, and wanted to do something toward the end of my career um, that wasn't... End of your career? I know, yeah. Well, you're only like 29 or something, aren't Thank you? you? Thank you. Oh, okay. I am. I'm, All right. I'm very close. Very close to 29. And speaking close, say close yes, to the microphone. close to so. the... So, segue, yes. you're not even going to be able to tell <laughs> I put lipstick on. That's weird. Okay. So, uh, end of the career, uh, or last, you know, five years, I thought I would be working, and I, I had a really great job. I was the vice president of a community foundation, and hmm. that was super fun in Grand Rapids, and just decided to abandon it all to go work in the cannabis industry. And so um, so here I am. So that so. begs the question, why? Well, why cannabis, I mean? Um, you know, I'm one of those people that if I was going to do something new or different, it had to be really different. I knew that if I just opened a PR firm, I would end up working with a bunch of uh, community foundations or, or, or nonprofits. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to really make a break, I'm going to like, Go big, and go so big. go big or, or go home or go broke. I'm not sure. So <laughs> <laughs> I think all of the above. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah, for, yeah, you never yeah. know yeah. what's going to happen. Talk to Mike about the joys yeah. of entrepreneurship. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. You're laughing one day, you're crying the next. Oh god. You know? Yeah. So, so yeah, good. So uh, let's get back to uh, a lot of people have a lot of skills in a lot of areas, but. You discover when you start a business that you don't know everything. And Matt and I are communications professionals. We both, for 150 years between the two of us, I think. Yeah. Not really that much. But uh, <laughs> but I've been doing it for 40 years, and you've been probably close for, to 40. Yeah, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. 80 years. Yep. So we kind of understand that. But the average person that's going to start a small business, I mean, they may understand social media somewhat. They may mm -hmm. have a Facebook page or, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, LinkedIn maybe. But uh, what, what should they really know about this? Well, I think if you're going to start your micro business, the first thing you need to do is think about your company name. Yeah. What mm. are you going to call it? And does it make sense? And where is it out in the universe right now? Because a lot of company names, you might want to be – you know, Greenville Cannabis Co. or something, and it's like, and there's already one of those out there. So, so trademark search right away? Trademark search or internet search. Um, even if you don't go trademarked, um, you know, don't don't decide to call your business over on, you know, cannabis. Yeah. Because bells will sue you. Absolutely. You know, yes. you know? and so think about that and, and you know. Find you know talk to your lawyer or um, or just do your own your own due diligence to see what's up there. I mean names like Google came up because there was nothing else left. You know mm -hmm. so you, you can always make something up. You know <clears throat> if nothing else and and made up names work pretty well. Okay, um, so so how do you counter sort of the public perception of of marijuana it is still federally a schedule one drug although who knows how much longer that's going to be i think be. that's going to change they're already having debates yeah. in congress about that but what's what's the pr strategy for is sort of for um you know dealing with that issue yeah and i had to deal with that a lot when i left conventional business in order to do that and i found really it's 
education. I spent the probably the last year and a half um, after I left my job and as I started this business and started to get some clients, I, it, it's always about education. It's telling people what do they want to know and, and answering questions that just random questions people would ask me. Mm-hmm. Hey, how do I get a medical marijuana card? Well, you, you can go to the state website, but it's like, hey, you know what? I'll write a blog on that and or I'll do a video on that. And so I did a lot of content creation based on what people wanted to know. Oh, every time I take marijuana, you know, I feel funny in the, you know. And so it's like, all right, well, maybe it's too much. or Maybe it's the wrong kind. Or how about, you know, how about microdosing? So then it's, a you know, some content on microdosing. So it's like education, education, education. So the first year that I was doing active writing, it was all education about marijuana and different aspects of marijuana. And now I'm doing a lot more writing about um public relations in your marijuana business Mm -hmm. and so i've been focusing on that so you know free things that you can find how to um, develop content um, ideas for moving things forward and so yeah it's it's been interesting Hmm. interesting so uh, what uh, what specifically would you tell people about uh, next steps Uh, go uh, so you get your name you discover it looks pretty unique yeah now, you can do then, the trademark search, but I know I've talked to lawyers, and you're going to spend a couple spend thousand a dollars yeah. on that. Um, uh, so get I'd, yourself a domain. Yeah. And that, find, find a good domain for yeah. your business. Um, if it's out there, um, then that's when you really, you know. Yeah, that's the first thing I do is I don't tell anybody what I'm thinking. Right. I go out and capture the domain name first, mm-hmm. and then I tell people about it. Absolutely. And so you get your domain. I mean, I never thought that I would get Canna Communication just two years ago, yeah, you know, I was like, Amazing. "Well, that's that's pretty good," you know. So, ooh, ooh. so um, you get your domain, and then I always tell people, you know, all the social media stuff is great, but you don't own it. You have to own your space. So, get a website, spend some money on a website, and preferably don't have your nephew, cousin, niece, or brother do it unless they are a professional web developer <laughs> you don't have to spend a ton of money you can do a wordpress site yeah get an easy wordpress site and then the next thing is like all right well i've got my domain i've got my my then you need your content you got to put something up there and that's where a lot of people turn to me because i love there's nothing i love more than writing website content it's mm. like oh man i just love <clears throat> it's part of that education public relations work that i do and so then getting you know getting the content on there and then producing regular content and that's really important too how how regular is regular should a business post something every day in this space do you think or what you know, god i wish about that a little bit. i wish yeah. you know i mean ideally it would be something new every day but you know i mean you're going to run out of steam and you're going to i try to do things on um when i'm on a good roll once mm-hmm. a week a really good blog about some topic in reality it's every two weeks you know, and so I mean, it's it's not easy. You guys, you know, to talk about being in communication. You know how hard it is. It isn't so hard writing it. It's what's the idea and mm. what do people want to know about. So it's looking at what people are talking about and then moving that content into or those ideas into some content that's useful and usable for people. Okay, what else should they know? Um, I think that, you know, you need to get your social sites up, you know, and you need you need to have those. But realize that at any given moment, Facebook can shut you down. Um, Instagram can shut you down. Twitter, not so much. Um, and LinkedIn, which is all of a sudden sort of turning into this really nice haven for cannabis that they Ooh. are. They, t- you know, old, weird old LinkedIn, you know, yeah, it's right, like, right. yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like they have not been. Um, hostile toward cannabis, and so that's been that's been a good place for um, for places to go. That's really to that's, go. that's really interesting because LinkedIn has a lot of the same functionality as Facebook. I mean, you can you know have a have a private conversation with someone. You can make public posts. You can post pictures. You yeah. can post video. You can do all that stuff on LinkedIn too. Yeah, absolutely. So. And they're not unfriendly to cannabis, you okay. know. And so it's, it, that is kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that I think, too, is really important when you're starting your company is to have a uh, what I like to call a discovery meeting. So sit down, talk with whoever it is that you are most close to, either your business partner or your spouse or whoever that might be, you know, that you're involved with in that business and talk about what do you visualize your business being? What do you, who do you want to serve and what kinds of things do you want people to think about you? And what are your values? And I know that sounds like 
just so you know conventional but what are the things that you believe in you know what you know what are your values what is your mission why are you, why do you exist in this cannabis space and be able to articulate that because then that will guide everything else that you do okay what else would you recommend I would also um, recommend I have to check my list. Check your list. Check, my list. <laughs> check it twice. Uh, you know, here's another thing. Um, I think it's really important to have great biographies of, mm. of the people in your company. So it's you that started it. I want to see, and people want to see, don't you, tell me if you don't do this. When you go to look at a website that you know isn't, isn't Amazon or somebody trying to sell you something, do you not go to look at, to see who's behind it? Sure. The about Always. section. Yeah. Yeah. Number, who are those people? God, did they go to the same college I went to? Do I know them? Or do we have any? Hey, that person runs, I run too. Hey, we both own wiener dogs. You know, what are those things that, <laughs> that are those commonalities? I don't think you own a wiener dog. No, you, man? no, no pets at no, this no. point. Oh, okay, well, I would highly recommend wiener dogs. They're okay. quite wonderful. Yeah, my, my in-laws had one. <laughs> for uh, a while. Yeah, yeah a it lot was of... delightful. Very, very. Yeah. Um, they used to like rooting around in suitcases. Whenever yes. you visited them, you couldn't leave your suitcase, suitcase. open in the yes. guest room. Yeah. They, or yeah. they'll go under your bed or into your socks. They're yeah. strange creatures. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I think a really good biography. People want to know who they're doing business with, whether yeah. you're selling cannabis or you're farming or what, you know, what's your background and what are you like? I think those things are really important for um for people to have on their website. And I think part of the problem with cannabis is that we have been underground for so long. And, mm-hmm. and every, you know, every grower, um, uh, caregiver, people who have owned provisioning centers have been very nervous about being out there where people can find them. And now that's changed. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we're all law-abiding citizens, abiding citizens now, or mostly. Yeah, and then hopefully and, with the feds, I think it'll happen sometime 2020, 2021. It's sort of it's sort of gone the same way that uh, um, that marriage equality did. You know, it, it seemed to be that there was like, you know, forty percent for it and sixty percent against it, and then virtually overnight it seemed to flip the other way. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. and it's it's that's pretty much where pot is at now. It's it, about about two thirds say what's the big deal. Yeah, I know? think there's so. a higher probability if a Democrat gets elected president that it would get legalized versus Trump. But I don't know. Maybe don't maybe you pull I a think, rabbit out of the hat. Yeah, you know? it, he, he might see that as a way to do better with the youth vote. That's, you never that's know. True. Yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that how that moves forward and and what it does and. Then and I think the very last thing that I want to say is, and we sort of almost always start with it, but it's so boring. But if you're going to start a business, you need a business plan, you need a communication plan, yeah. you know, because otherwise you're chasing rabbits the whole time. You're yeah. just like off in a different direction. Somebody knocks on the door. It's like, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. You know, and and so having a comprehensive strategy is the best way for your micro business to be successful, to have that understanding of what, you know, what you need to do and how you need to do it, and then moving that um, moving that forward and executing that plan. Okay. okay, we got less than a minute left. Roberta, why don't you tell folks uh, how they can reach out and talk to you? Sure. You can find me at cannacommunication.com. And so that's singular communication. That and is Canna correct. is C-A-N-N-A communication.com yep okay. and yeah hopefully um, i'm easy to find on the internet okay <laughs> all right all right thanks very much roberta king owner of canna communications where are you based out of um out of muskegon, muskegon. how about that okay. Whoa. Awesome. yeah 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 my uh, my dad and stepmom lived for years in uh, um grand haven so i'm real familiar Aww, with it so yep. that's great all right thank you very much roberta from canna communications we'll be right back in just a minute with another segment of the m squared tech cast thank you
Come on now. This and is a PG go. rated show here. Yes. It's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with today's third segment on the M Squared TechCast, now with video. Yep. And the whole uh, show today is devoted to you want to start a cannabis micro business? Well, we got the experts here that are going to tell you how to do that, including Scott Roberts, a principal at Scott F. Roberts Law Group. Where are you based out of? Uh, downtown Detroit. Okay. And what he's going to talk about are some of the basic requirements and restrictions applicable to the uh, micro business license. So this is the legal part. So uh, take it away, Scott. Sure. You know, the, the micro business, just kind of a general perspective, we sometimes call it uh, a caregiver license on steroids because a lot of what the caregivers are doing right now, the micro business allows you to do that under the, the rec market. Mm -hmm. So kind of very big picture, what the micro business allows you to do is grow 150 plants, Whoa. process those plants, and then sell them all direct to the consumer. Um, but what it doesn't allow you to do is purchase someone else's plants for sales to the consumer or sell to, say, another micro business or another licensed entity. So, so you, 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 it's very vertical in this case. Yeah, it, it is a 100% vertical license. Mm. And it, mm. you can do pretty much everything the processor, retailer, and grower license can do, you know, subject to the plant counts, uh, but do it with only one license and only pay a six to $10,000 licensing assessment as opposed to, you know, under the medical right now would be something like $190,000. Yeah, I looked at that. Everything. some big numbers that yeah. scare peop most people off anyway. Yep, yep, yeah, and big capital requirement. Oh, so. yeah. yeah. So, all right, so um, <laughs> let's, let's start right at the beginning. So you've got, uh, of course, 150 plants. You're talking about a very large area. That you know, How many acres is that? Well, you know, 150 plants, that can be grown in as big or as small of a space as you want. It mm -hmm. kind of depends on your, your cultivation methods. You know, you could easily fit that in a 1,000 a square feet if you kind of had very small plants, mm -hmm. um, but you're not going to necessarily get the yield you're probably going to want because, mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully you are you have a lot of demand for your product and you're going to be selling uh, more than you would produce in just 1,000 square feet. Um you know, some people four or five thousand square feet would be best. Um, it just, you know, it's there's really no right or wrong answer on that. I know my uh, my tomato plants do best when you plant them about three feet apart, and I think we're talking about roughly the same size plant. So, uh, you know, yeah, but I with a marijuana plant, you know, you can have very small plants hmm. um, that you just kind of continuously harvest, or you can grow really large plants. So and they can the, be ten foot tall too, right? Yeah, with the large plants, you know, you're going to get a lot more yield per plant, mm -hmm. and because the ma marijuana micro business, you know, it's limited by the 150 plants. You know, if you're going to want to say have enough to to process and mm -hmm. sell a fair amount of processed goods in addition to flour. You know, at least with uh, some of those 150, you're going to be really incentivized to grow really, really big plants that can yield, you know, upwards of 10 pounds per plant. Wow, times 150. Hmm. Um, so uh, th let's start with the basic steps. Now, so someone wants to get a license, how do they proceed to do that? So there's kind of three hurdles to cross. Um, you know, the first hurdle I would say is getting uh, a location in a municipality that will let you operate. Um, you know, the rec law is considered kind of an opt-out law, meaning if you don't opt out, you're considered technically opted in. But, you know, the practicality of that is that you still really need a municipal approval. You're still going to need a C of O. And then the municipality... Unless you know, you're growing in a rural area or something, right? But, well, it's a marijuana micro business is still a facility. Okay. So as a facility, you have to have, you know four walls, the ceiling, um, you have to meet certain uh, well, building you can't grow it outside then? Um, you would be able to cultivate outside if you're, you know, complying with the outdoor cultivation rules mm -hmm. um, that are out there. Um, however, Do you have to have security or something? Or? Well, you're, you're going to have to, again, so, you know, each little segment of what you're doing, you have to comply with the rules applicable to those other licenses. So, mm -hmm. for instance, with your retail component, you have to comply with all the rules that are applicable to uh, marijuana retailers under the recreational law hmm. and for the processing, you know, so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, Joe uh, Joe Average wants to start one of these. Uh, maybe he doesn't want to do he or she doesn't want to do 150 plants. They who do they apply to? 
So, you know, you're going to have to get municipal approval. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to apply and receive a municipal license, mm-hmm. but you do have to get their, you know, approval in one way, shape, or form, whether that takes the form of a C of O, or I think a lot of the places will literally just have licenses the mm-hmm. same way they do under medical. Um, on top of that, you have to, you know, get approved by the state. And the mm-hmm. state has kind of broken up the, the rec process into, um, you know, prequal or prequalification, similar mm-hmm. to how they have done in the med medical, and then as well as kind of a final license. So those are kind of like the three barriers, the state prequalification, the municipal, you know, finding a property, which is probably be the, the toughest part of yeah, this. Yeah, and most expensive, too. Well, then you got to set everything up. I mean, you got to set up, gr- if it's indoors, you have to set up grow lights and uh, all these facilities for growing, however you're going to do that. I don't know if you do it with hydroponics, but certainly it'd probably just be a large pot and soil and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the build-out costs are, are probably going to be somewhat substantial, kind of similar to what we're seeing on, on the medical side because, mm-hmm. you know, they have to comply with all those rules about, you know, like fire suppression and commercial grade walls and doors. So, you know, the, the practical effect, there are no capitalization requirements for the micro business. Well, realistically, you're looking at fifty or $100,000 or something, right? Or um, yeah, For a build-out, you know, it could easily exceed that amount. Wow. So it's still, uh, uh, and probably you're going to see people teaming up rather than an individual coming up with all that cash, right? Yeah, and you know we have a lot of clients right now who maybe only have you know fifty or a hundred thousand dollars, but they're they're raising that from friends and family or outside investors. Um, you know, there's also a couple um, kind of financial brokers who are. Uh, who are able to kind of connect people with lenders in the area, both kind of asset-based and Mm income-based. So, you know, there is the availability to kind of finance some Mm -hmm. of these projects with debt, which a lot of people, you know, just don't realize is is out there and available. Yeah, it wasn't available before. Uh, Then, uh, so the pre-qualification process, uh, do they have to lay out the six or eight thousand dollars then the pre-qualification comes it seems like you'd want to get pre-qualified before you lay out the money right well you know when we're talking about the you know the application fee that's different from like the licensing fee and this oh, is it something is. Okay. that kind of gets a lot of people confused um so it's a six thousand dollar application fee that you have to pay yeah, right and up no matter front. what happens you still up, have to pay that, that's right? up front yeah before yeah. you even start okay and then i would assume they're going to administer rec similar to the medical where the um the license fee is kind of the last step of the process mm-hmm. you know the way i like to explain it is like you kind of give them the check and they give you the license ah Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Because otherwise, they you lay out the money and they turn you down. You're just out the money, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we expect the the rec kind of licensing to be a lot kind of easier um, than it was in medical just last year. You know, we've already seen the medical licensing process really, um, you know, speed up, and also you know things that were causing denials in 2018 just quite simply, aren't causing denials in 2019. Such as? Um, So, you know, in 2018, you know, you forgot to put one charge from 1988 on your criminal history disclosure, completely honest mistake. People were getting denied for that. Mm. Um, Just across the board. Well, different administration, too. I mean, uh, Mm -hmm. I was at Hash Bash this year and heard that Governor Whitner was in there, but... She had a uh, announcement that she played congratulating everybody, and I, I don't think Rick Snyder would have done that. So, uh, uh, but so it's a little bit of attitude change. Bill there. Schuette certainly would have. Definitely think. not. Yeah. yeah so, um, all right. Uh, so, uh, it, what, what else? What kind of advice? Other advice would you advise on anybody wanting to start a micro business? One thing I would say is, you know, it is a marijuana business, and right. that's kind of sexy um Mm -hmm. but you still got to treat it like another business so you know with a lot of my clients from before you know before i got into the cannabis field a few years ago you know usually if they were looking to start a business we would advise them to kind of write up a business plan um you know to the extent applicable maybe do some just basic market research and then also kind of put together a financial pro forma which is kind of your projected numbers how much money you have to make to break even, you know, how much money you'll make at certain kind of thresholds. 
And that's something, you know, I advise everyone who's getting into a new business to do. And I don't think it's any different for marijuana companies. And Mm -hmm. it's something, strangely, that a lot of times marijuana companies don't do as much. Um, You know, they think more of seat of the pants kind of thing. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's marijuana. Of course, I'll make money. Um, I don't have to think about that. (laughs) Um, And, you know, the the thing is, yeah, you, you still have to think about that. You know, as the market you know, fills up a little more and gets saturated, there will be some competition and you really want to make sure you're positioned well. And that means kind of planning things from the beginning as opposed to just kind of flying by the seat of your pants. Well, well, one thing I was right. curious about, and, and I don't know if you if you know this, you, you probably do, uh, how long does it take to raise a marijuana plant to where you can cultivate it and, you know, turn it into something you can sell? So that actually kind of goes back to our, you know, discussion on how big your plant is. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you can have plants that are, if they're small, you know, we were talking a couple months from, you know, a little seedling to a a big plant. But, you know, if you're growing these really big plants, then, you know, you can, it's going to take a much, much longer time and you spend three or four months just vegging. Mm. Mm. Okay. And then uh, in terms of pricing and all that is just whatever the market will bear. There aren't any regulations on you can, you can sell it for, you have to sell it for $100 an ounce or whatever, you know, nothing like that. Huh? No, no. I mean, the, the market is setting the price. And right now that price is really, really high, mm-hmm. um, a lot higher than it probably should be. Because if you compare it, you know, the pro- the price of licensed product versus the price of caregiver product, there's a really big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, as time goes on, that will uh, start to drop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as market forces take hold, you know, hopefully there will find an equilibrium. We won't end up like Oregon where the price just, you know, essentially crashed. Um, But, you know, the advantage of the micro business is because you're vertically integrated, you're not really subject to the daily fluctuations of the wholesale price. Mm Because when the wholesale price fluctuates, um, the consumer price doesn't really fluctuate as much. All right. So, um, what's do other states have micro businesses of the type that uh, Michigan is establishing under its law? I mean, is that the case in Colorado or Oregon? So, the two states that have implemented programs that are somewhat far along in them are California and Nevada. And California really has been the leader in this. There's a couple more states that recently just did micro business programs. I believe New Jersey, Massachusetts also have one. Mm-hmm. Um, but California has kind of taken the lead, and there's, I believe, over 200 micro businesses in California. Hmm. Theirs is slightly different. You know, they don't do plant count; they do canopy size, and they have some some rules that aren't really applicable to Michigan. But like the basic concept is the same, and you've seen these, you know, really take off in California. And I I would expect the same thing to happen here in Michigan. All right, we've got a uh, little minute. less than a yes. minute left, so why don't you tell people how they can reach you and uh, you know. What kind of services you offer? Sure. Yeah. So we are uh, a full service cannabis business law firm. Uh, My background is really working with businesses and uh, real estate companies uh, prior to the cannabis industry. Uh, My, you know, to get a hold of me, uh, scottrobertslaw.com is our website. I'd also say marijuanamicrobusinesses.com is another great resource that we we post on quite a bit. And you can contact us uh, through that as well. And um, yeah, anything. All right. Well, there you have it, the lawyer's point of view. So yes. all these points are very important. Yeah, PR, HR, legal, and then uh, next we're going to have up... Uh, accountants. Accountants, yes. Okay. So CPAs. You yes. do have to count the beans. You yes. do, yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Scott Roberts, principal at Scott F. Roberts Law Group. We'll be back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast in just a minute. For right now, this is Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And if you're watching live, you're at podcastdetroit.com.
Only our second video show, so we're still kind of getting our legs. Yep. Don't worry, you know. Kinks. Okay, there we go. And. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast, now on video. Indeed it is. And we have with us, well, actually, we should probably uh, preface that by saying this whole show is devoted to you want to start a cannabis micro business? Well, we've got the experts that can give you some advice on how to do that. And we just learned from our last guest that Michigan is somewhat unique in terms of its legal approach to cannabis micro businesses, yeah. which was kind of interesting to see. Yes, so it's been an eye-opening. Uh, I, I'm learning things that I did not know, so I, hopefully the audience will as well. Yep. And we have with us uh, Karina Miller, CPA, president and founder of LC Solutions, and you're out of Flint, right? Yes, we are. And with you, uh, us, with me with, is with uh, Sarah Joslin. She's marketing and business development manager of LC Solutions. Welcome to the both of you to the show. Thank you. We're excited All to be right. here. So we had the HR, we had the PR, we had the uh, JD, the lawyer. <laughs> I was trying to think of something faster. Yeah, right. And, and now we have the CPA. So we've had the full alphabet soup here. We have, yes. Okay. And so uh, I guess that's important because uh, in the end, you got to get all this paperwork process. You got to do your taxes. You got to deal with whomever, all these various authorities. And you're going to tell us how to do that, right? Yes. You have to worry about taxes. And in this industry, anybody getting into any type of marijuana business, um, micro businesses, you have to worry about uh, federal tax laws being different than state tax laws, too. So there's additional accounting and record keeping. Um, you cannot deduct a lot of your business expenses. Whoa. So making Damn. sure that you the expenses that you can deduct are properly recorded and you have all of the receipts and, and records there, that that's our job. Um, that's our favorite thing to go in and do is uh, make sure our business is compliant with their accounting. So if a state regulator or uh, an IRS auditor or anyone wanted to come in and look at those books, they can essentially open them up and, and everything is there. It's it's perfect. They don't have anything to worry about. So so what's not deductible and why? What's the rationale? Um, so the uh, cannabis businesses have to follow uh, code section 280E. And what that says is only their cost of their goods sold can be deducted. So cost of goods is, is the cost that it uh, takes to grow and produce their product. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about a micro business who has a cultivation portion has a processing portion then has the retail portion if we if we draw lines between each of those then the cultivation and the processing activities are in general deductible but once those products are ready they're ready to be put on the shelf and then sold to the the patient or the customer those selling costs are no longer deductible. So what we would consider SG&A on a regular exactly, financial statement. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah. so no marketing expenses, no bud tender wages, um, accounting fees, attorney fees, uh, all of those would fall into the SG&A, would not be deductible. Is that partly because of where marijuana still is in the federal drug schedule? Yes. That, okay. That's, that's yeah. the only reason for it. Yeah. Um, 280E has been in existence since 1982, okay. so very outdated laws. But until cannabis is descheduled, that's where we're at. Okay. Oh. Well, we were just talking about that in the last segment. Hopefully that will occur in 2021, 20, somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, I know Congress just debated it, I think it was last week. Yeah, it was. Um, where, you know, the process is starting. How long it will take? Hmm, who knows? But uh, certainly, uh, of course, I'm not sure politicians are really looking at polls these days. But the polls seem to indicate that you know, on, a, on a national level, everybody wants this legalized yeah, but it's, and, and it's about two-thirds for at least decriminalization yeah I think. right so yeah. baby boomers are probably driving it because they're retiring they want to kick back and <laughs> light up right Man, well that moved that, to traverse city that they've all got farm uh, well that we've all got bad knees so we want yeah. easy access to edibles thank right, you very that much too, yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, so tell us a little bit more now. So uh, we've gone through the, the, the different things that need to be done to set up a business that we're at the CPA level. So what would be the first steps? I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about taxes and all that, how yeah. to sort that all out. But how do they get started? So first steps with any business on, on the accounting side, you've got to register for business taxes. We can help with that process. Um, from there, we're very focused on 
your accounting needs as you're in business. So not what you're doing at the end of the year to get ready for taxes, not what you're doing because the, the government's come in to look at everything. We want to make sure everything is, is compliant and how it should be all along. So from day one, we help you uh, set up your accounting system on the back end. So if you're using a software like QuickBooks, for example, to track all of your, your revenues and expenses, we make sure that your chart of accounts is 280 specific. So mm-hmm. again, there is no um, you know misunderstanding of what should be deducted and what's not. Um, record keeping is big for us. So I, I have a team of bookkeepers who are perfectionists. If you send us a transaction and it does not have a receipt behind it, we, we don't accept that. We're coming back to you and saying we need to have this information. So we're, we're almost like a, a third party. Um, your, your employees aren't going to like us at all, but, th- but that's what our, <laughs> our job is. That's what we're there to do. Um, you know, and our, our goal is to make sure ultimately you're the business owner at your business. You, you have to make sure that those things are in place, and that's what we're there to help you. Um, we'll help train your employees. So a lot of times, um, you know, somebody working in the accounting records or, or doing these day-to-day things do not have any type of accounting experience at all. Mm-hmm. So we'll go in there and, and help them. Um, get their processes in place, make sure inter- internal controls are in place. We have a lot of cash movements in this business, so making sure all of that's tracked properly. Um, and then uh, on the back end, again, a part part of the rule set is that once a year, your books and records are subject to audit either by the LARA reviewer, so the, the state government, or a third-party independent CPA. So we we make sure that you're you're very well prepared for that. So so what's the status of banking law when it comes to cannabis businesses? I mean, can you use a bank now? Is it still the way it used to be where no bank would touch the money or Well, it, they did touch it, but it was like very quietly on the side. Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's still like that. So it's it's up to the bank itself to develop procedures that allows them to be compliant. Mm-hmm. Um I'll say we work with plenty of clients that that have banking. Now, mm-hmm. whether it's a, it's a hundred percent how it, it would be required, um, first goes from from your location to the Federal Reserve and then to the bank. There, there's never that direct transfer into a bank account. Um, you know, there's there's very few and far between banks in Michigan that I know are offering programs like that and and doing things one hundred percent by the book. Um, but yes, banking is still probably that that's on the federal side. But a, a bank, there's nothing stopping a bank from doing it other than their own um, fears and hesitations to make sure that their processes are in place so that they can be compliant on their back end. Mm -hmm. Because I know uh, in the early days of all this in other states, they you know, you have tremendous cash on hand, and they didn't have any place to park it. Mm-hmm. Boy, talk about uh, an incentive for very bad people to come pay you a visit, right? You know, right. so uh, right, it's still it's still a problem. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of existing operators, they are paying all of their taxes in cash. So even even that in itself is a is an issue because you have to take these sums of money to either the, the IRS office in Lansing or Detroit or, or wherever you're going. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but Prop, it, yeah, the it, city hall for property taxes. That exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah. It, and it, it is what it is. I mean, you it doesn't just because you're operating in cash doesn't mean you can't do everything correctly on the back end. I mean, we, we haven't always had credit cards and, and checks. There is True. there is a way to to work compliantly in cash. Hmm. So what other pointers would you uh, give uh, for folks that want to get all set up legally and, and get their books to, in order and whatnot? Um, number one is take it seriously. Um, the biggest problem we run into is, you know, accounting usually gets put on the back burner because people think about just taxes and, oh, I, I don't have to worry about it until next April. Mm-hmm. Well, then then you're caught in a position where you weren't doing things correctly or it's it, it's a mess. I mean, we, we've seen plenty of... Um, of shoeboxes, I'll say, full of receipts. And it's nice that all those things are there, but, um, you know, my best advice is be proactive and have have those um, procedures in place from day one. Um, two, tax structuring and tax planning is important. So because we're, we're very limited on deductions, there's some other things that can be done in terms of how to set up your entity for, for different tax structures. Um, depending on where businesses are going to be operating and where they're going to be infusing funds into, we may be able to take advantage of Opportunity Zone um, uh, funding where it gives you a little bit of break on taxes there. So that there's a lot of different pieces that we can look at, but we need to do that from the start. Mm-hmm. 
I want to ask uh, uh, Sarah a question here about how you go about marketing this business. Who are you, uh, you know, how are you coming up with clients and, and sort of what's your function there? What's, you know, how is it to market a business like this? Um, so far, I've just been going to... i lean in just a little bit more there. Current um, open uh, dispensaries, mm-hmm. um, things like that, dropping off our information, letting them know they need to be 280E compliant. Okay. Yeah, we'd... How's that going? Is that working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are they surprised that there's a CPA firm out there that specializes in this area? Yeah, some of them are kind of (laughs) shocked. Yeah, it's still very nascent, so. Yeah. All right, what else do you do? I mean, uh, do you advertise? Do you get on social media? What what, what, What sort of tips can you provide? Yeah, we post on social media. We're active on Facebook. Um, I send out emails postcards yeah we we do a lot of um print mailing Mm -hmm. so so we get our marketing list from from the reports that the mre sends out from from weed maps leafly you know existing operators um we do we just did canacon a few weeks ago so we we try to do four or five of the major exhibit type events um we we do pretty well but a lot of it is the in-person you know that that sarah's doing and making that that physical contact being in front of somebody. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, what else would you tell folks uh, that, uh, what's the very first thing they should do? Let's start with that. First thing they should do, um, you know, I mentioned business taxes that you, you've got to set up, um, you know, make sure you, that your business is set up. From there, call us. I mean, we, we, we have a lot of clients where we're working with them and kind of helping them on the back end, but they're not quite ready to open their doors yet. So we're doing all that pre-work with them. And, you know, we, we understand we, we work with, with all startup businesses. So we, we get it that, you know, you're, you're out there, you're doing this. We can't push too hard on you for what's needed on our end, but we, you know, that, that relationship is going to pay off down the road. So, don't be afraid to to call us to contact us and we'll we'll help you with that starting and then when the point comes where you're starting to accumulate expenses or things are starting to complicated you know then it's time to move into a a bookkeeping model or a a continuing services model Um, but we we try to be very proactive and it you know again we get small business that that's all that um, you know we've done prior to this until this um, commercial licensing so we're very well poised for the micro business market um, so to answer your question, call us and we'll, we'll help you through with the rest of it. Well, that's a great segue because we're down to a little over a minute to go. So you need to tell people how to get a hold of you now. So you can reach us on our website. Uh, it's lcsolutionsmichigan.com. And our, our contact information, our phone number, our email, everything is on there. Um, Sarah mentioned we're also active on Facebook. So you can reach out to us there, um, message us or, or send us a, a, a comment through there. Um, we're 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 out there. So if you Google uh, accounting firm marijuana in Michigan, it, we're we're one of the first to pop up. So we're able to be found. Okay. Right. Thanks very much, Karina Miller and Sarah Joslin of LC Solutions of Michigan, CPAs out of Flint for the cannabis industry. I want to thank the two of you. I want to thank all of our guests today. We had Scott Roberts, principal at Scott F. Roberts Law Group of Detroit. We had Roberta King, owner of Canna Communications out of Muskegon, and Anthony Sabatella, president of THC123, which is an HR firm for cannabis businesses. He's in Oakland County somewhere. I'm not sure which city he's out of. Yeah. but uh, So we have a nice representation around the state. Y- yes, and we do. And we also had just about every business service you'd need if you're a cannabis business. That's one of the things that happens when a new industry comes up like this is that you have a whole universe of service providers, an ecosystem kind of. Indeed. Yep. Okay, well, thanks to all our guests today. We'll be back uh, next week at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, hopefully in our full TV studio. Yeah, right, Jess, um, hopefully. Yes. We've done, we've, hopefully. We've yes. done the last two, two weeks right. in our old, with video in our old radio studio, kind of cobbling it together. But we have made the commitment to go to video, and uh, hopefully we'll be in the other building next week. We do hope that, yes. All right, for right now, this is Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And you've been listening to the M Squared TechCast at podcastdetroit.com.